I'm Trainer Hansen, and I teach at the writing program in the English department. And um, this quarter, I'm teaching Writing 1100 and Writing 1000, so two writing classes. And I'm Peg Achterman. I'm in communication and journalism. And this quarter, I'm teaching Journ 1000, which is Fundamentals of Digital and Online Media, and um, our advanced multimedia class. I'm Katie Douglas. I'm teaching two classes this quarter. Um, one's called Foundations of the Spiritual Life. The second class is University Foundations 1000. And then I'm also doing two independent studies that I'm really excited about. Hi, I am Emily Kelly. I'm the director of the Nursing Clinical Learning Lab in the School of Health Sciences. I do not teach any courses directly, but I facilitate and have oversight over all of the simulation sessions that we do in the nursing um, department. And those are scattered throughout all of the courses that we offer. I'm Lane Seeley uh, in the physics department, and I'm teaching um, a course in global climate change this quarter, um, along with uh, our experimental methods uh, course and a couple of uh, undergraduate research projects. Cool. I'm Danny Helseth. I'm in the music department. I am conducting the wind ensemble this quarter mm -hmm. and also doing um, a survey of American popular music for music majors and running the project capstone for our graduating seniors. I'm Scott Beers. I'm in the School of Education. I'm teaching two classes this quarter. One is EDRD 2000, the psychology of reading. And the other class I'm teaching is a um, kind of a graduate version of that class called Foundations of Reading Instruction. I'm Candace Vance. I'm the head of performance in the theater department. And this quarter I'm teaching Writing 1100. I'm also teaching Acting Shakespeare and then mentoring, overseeing all of the performative senior projects in the department. Oh, and I'm also teaching theater capstone. That's just a lot of classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Karen Gutowski Zimmerman, and I teach within the art department, School of Visual, um, Visual Communications major. And this is my big load this quarter. I'm teaching a VizCom 2 class, a Type 2 class, and a capstone class. And I've also been running a year long independent study with uh, nine students from uh, that are throughout the, the university, so. My name is Tom Carpenter. I teach in the School of Psychology, Family and Community. And this quarter I am teaching Introduction to Statistics an Advanced Research Methods class where we're gonna run a study. And then I'm also teaching a class on discerning your career and planning for it with psych majors. So it'll be a fun quarter. As I mentioned earlier, I facilitate all of our simulation sessions, which traditionally have all been face-to-face -face in the clinical learning lab, um, and we are not able to do that anymore. So we are switching to virtual simulation, which is pretty exciting for us. It's actually not new in healthcare simulation. It's been around for at least 10 years or so, um, but it'll be, it'll be new to us. And so we're exploring some of the different platforms that are out there. And uh, there's a lot of, as technology has advanced, so has the fidelity in virtual simulation. And there's a lot of really cool platforms out there that we're looking at using and integrating into the simulation sessions that we can offer. Well, I think like Emily, I um, there's just so many different uh, apps and software now available for our students. So I'm really trying to be challenged that everything that the students are doing, they can do within the framework of their house. And so, you know, how do we brainstorm? How do we do mind maps? How do we um, do collaborative learning? And so we've been looking at like Google Jam boards and a lot of different, you know, different kind of software, software to have collective learning. So that's kind of fun. I know I'm uh, kind of like Karen in that, um, uh, I'm teaching uh, digital online media, so I'm trying to figure out different ways for students to record um, interviews from Zoom or from Skype or whatever, or um, even just off of their phones so that they're doing journalism interviews, learning uh, to edit audio that way, and probably video, just um, learning the basics of uh, making a sequence in video so that it might just be you know, buttering a piece of bread, but whatever it is that they can do within their house. And also pointing them to some, uh, some learning things that are, are um, online now for free. Um, Karen and I both know that Adobe has made their um, suite free for a while here for students. So that's pretty exciting to me. I'm just trying to figure out how to be, how they can be journalists 
can find. And most journalists in the country are doing that right now too. So it's kind of fun to be able to tell people about others who are like broadcasting from their closets. <laughs> so. I'm really excited to be teaching this quarter for two reasons. Uh, in our stats class, we have the opportunity to analyze online data in uh, a very live, real sense. So what we're doing in both my stats and research classes is actually a, a mirror of the research process now. Most researchers, especially in psychology, are not physically in one location. We're dispersed around the country and we work in these remote teams, uh, is how I do a lot of my scholarly and professional work. If you want to analyze any data or even collect any data now, you're doing it online. So as much as the environment has changed, the subject matter is actually the same. And in some ways, we're more closely mirroring that professional experience. So I've been able to build my classes the same way I would build my professional teams, which is uh, live Zoom meetings. So my students and I are going to be meeting and talking and conversing, much like we're doing right now, which gives us a chance to connect and build community uh, and for my extrovert self meet some of those social needs um, uh, but more meeting those social needs for my students whereas at the same time we're able to share screens we're able to pull up data and analyze it together um, we've set up zoom to facilitate this so we can share files through zoom now we can do polling through zoom now and because of all these features we're able to run our meetings not dissimilarly to the way we would in person so I'm actually really looking forward to a chance to bring my students into this space and shepherd them along the way. And I hope we're going to have a lot of fun because we've got some really fun online research to conduct this quarter. And uh, that research is going to be able to proceed the same way it would in an in-person classroom. So it's going online, but it's not a traditional online class. Now, follow on Tom's point, I, I think that's one of the things that's really exciting for our students that you know, I, I came to SPU way back in the year 2001. And at that point in time, I think on a weekly basis, I had basically zero virtual meetings. And, uh, and you know, just, just in the last few years, I typically have, you know, maybe five or six virtual meetings a week uh, before any of the issues with the, with the corona um, virus pandemic. And so, so I think, you know, even after we've made it through this, this time of, of challenge with the pandemic, we, our students are going to move out into a, a world where um, virtual meetings are a very commonplace thing um, in all different uh, careers that they might choose. And I, I guess if I were in their place, I would, I would think this is, you know, a really a neat chance to, to, uh, test and learn a whole new set of skills around communicating um, in a virtual environment. And, and I think they're gonna take those skills away from this um, and it's gonna be a really powerful tool for them. I'll jump in too with something that um, is maybe not as technology dependent as some of the virtual meetings and Zoom. Um, in the School of Education, we've been teaching online classes um, for more than 15 years. And so we've been able to see um, some of the advantages and some of the um, challenges that come with that. I just wanna make a plug for the different kinds of conversations you can have. We will of course have conversations um, using technology and meeting all together at the same time, but we will also have discussions that take place outside of the class time. And one of the advantages that we've seen for a long time is that um, in, in in room discussions, a lot of the attention and time goes to those that are quick to speak, those that can articulate their thoughts. Yeah. You, have, you yeah. have students in the class that can sometimes take up more of the airspace than the other students that want more time to process, that maybe aren't as bold in a group setting. And having discussions that happen offline gives everyone a chance to think about their answers, to share what they want. And sometimes these offline discussions are better mm -hmm. than what we see in class when everybody's in the same place. And so, Finding ways to take advantage of both, I think, can be a really powerful learning experience and really good for the for the learning community that's in the class. I can follow up on that. Um, my writing classes are, in a lot of ways, old fashioned and sort of thinking about, I mean, we're in the room and we talk about writing and then we practice writing and we discuss our writing together. And so uh, what's been exciting for me, I think, is thinking about ways to change what that time looks like um and i think really in a way that allows kind of following 
up on what Scott said um, for a more equitable learning environment as well. So as I am looking at Zoom meetings and, and thinking that too many Zoom meetings are gonna be exhausting for my students, it's really helped me to rethink how I'm prioritizing that time and then other ways that we can spend class that that doesn't have to be that sort of like that group coming together so that when we do come together as a group uh, there's a more of a focus and more of a purpose to that so I'm, I'm doing a lot of pre-recorded lectures um, if I figure if I can deliver the content and and sort of like give uh, students a chance to get that and we don't have to do that in person that's fine and then that creates opportunities for students to access the material on their own time and to work through it and to go back and rewatch some of those videos if they didn't pick it up um, in class. And even finding ways to do like live note taking in class through a shared Word document or Google Doc that then gives ways to, um, to collect those notes and to have them accessible to everybody outside the class. And so I'm really seeing this opportunity for more equitable learning and different learning styles um, that's really helping me to rethink a lot of what I've done already as a teacher over all of these years and to think about like how that might change uh, going forward. Trainer, when I, um, cause we had to jump on so quickly during finals um, and I didn't really know, you know, I wasn't up on scaffolding and all these kind of, you know, flip classrooms and all that kind of stuff. We were, we were told, but I hadn't experienced it yet. So one of the things that we did with our paper was we had them break, I had them break out into uh, breakout rooms on Zoom and they did peer review papers. That was the best session they've done in all my W classes for years. They spent time, they looked at each other's papers, they shared their screens. It, it was really impactful for me. It, I, I got to go back and forth between the Zoom rooms and or the breakout rooms. And it made me realize, yes, I'm redesigning all of my classes so that they are, when we are synchronous, when we are on Zoom, we're using it as community building and we're using it as a critique space. And, um, and then the other stuff would be through lectures that they can watch on their own. But it was really impactful to see how strong uh, th this environment can be in that space. I'm teaching a class on um, the foundations of the spiritual life. And one thing we try to do in that class is practice the spiritual disciplines on our own throughout the week. And then during our class time, we'll talk about um, how it went and talk about how it's so hard and we fail a lot. And um, so one of the things that is hard to um, to kind of fabricate for students sometimes is, is different types of experiences, but a lot of really big existential questions are happening right now that make, um, that make uh, those disciplines even more significant. So for example, one week we try to practice solitude. <clears throat> what does it mean to, to be alone? Um, not to necessarily be quiet, but to be alone for an extended period of time. And, and I think that conversation will be so much more, so much richer uh, because we're all <laughs> forced into solitude. Um, we also, um, uh, it, theologians like Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called Life Together, and he talks about what's the value of life alone and what's the value of life together. And those types of balance in our life are disrupted right now. So I think that um, for that class, it will be enriched. We also have a week where we talk about celebration. What does it mean to celebrate Easter or celebrate Christmas when we're not doing it in person? In what part of God's incarnation um, that God chose to become flesh to be with us. What does that mean and look like right now when we're um, supposed to be physically separated? So I'm, uh, I'm an ordained minister, but I'm also part of a lot of uh, conversations online with pastors um, talking about this. What does it mean? Uh, can we do baptism? baptism apart? Um, or is that something we really need to wait until we're back together to mark somebody's uh, death and resurrection as having a new identity in Jesus Christ? So those are some of the things I'm, I'm most excited about is the way our current moment in time is going to enrich the conversation. And honestly, I feel like the Zoom platform is going to work um, just fine to have that type of conversation for that class. It's only 13 students and we sit and we talk about what we did throughout the week. Um, that's how we use our time anyway. And so I feel like in some ways um, it won't be that different, um, which to, but, but the content of what they're learning throughout the week will be significantly different. Right now, 
all of our social structures have fallen apart in society. And one of the things that I have the privilege of doing is providing some structure for my students. So that's one reason why we're gonna have um, regular, if you look at my Canvas page, um, you see a module for every class meeting, mm -hmm. which has really clearly laid out exactly what they're to do by when. And there's some uh, structure and accountability for students to help keep them on track. So I, I want my students to know, and I want any incoming students to know, that this quarter is going to have a lot of structure for you. And at the same time, this quarter is enabling me some flexibility. If a student is unable to attend a live class, then I've got all of my classes recorded. So we can still have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Students, you know, I can't teach stats or research methods by screencast. I've tried. Uh, I need that interaction. My students need to be able to tell me, what about this? Or that does not make sense. And we can go there and it's interactive. Uh, you know, this has forced me to just be 100, my 100% 100 A game with organization. Mm -hmm. And um, thinking about all these tools and the ways I'm leveraging them now, I don't want to go back. I want to take advantage of all this stuff once this thing is over because it is really creating a, a much improved experience for my students, even over what I would have uh, historically done. Yeah, this is completely different um, for, for us, in the, in the, especially in the band world, the performance model. Um, in many ways, I think, that, well, what, so I can tell you what we're doing. Uh, we had the opportunity, we've been working with an organization called andwewerheard.org, which is um, it's a, it's a representation of a whole bunch of uh, female composers and composers of colors. And the idea behind this organization is to, um, is to hook a composer up with an ensemble and have that ensemble record a piece with that composer right. to give them a recording of their work so they can get the music out there. We were on tap to record two pieces this next quarter for this. Uh, the students were excited about it. Two very, very cool Latinx composers that we were working with. And we were all really bummed when we realized that we might not be able to do this. But as I started talking with Ron Haight in the music technology department, I realized that we're actually set up really well to do one of these virtual ensembles. We have an isolation booth for recording, <laughs> aptly named the vocal isolation booth, which has a glass wall between it and the engineer. And so I'm working with Ron right now to create a click track for our students to play along to, to rehearse to. And then when they're ready, they can go into Nickerson Studios into the ISO booth and actually record their part with a click track. And then Ron and I, with a video, so then Ron and I can put together this virtual ensemble. You've seen New York Philharmonic release something last night. Uh, yeah. Graham Kaphausen did something similar to this, although everybody just used their phones in their room. So this, this recording quality is gonna actually be very, very high because we're gonna have really good microphones and really good technology and mixing. And then we're able to give our music technology students an opportunity to have a project to work on as well in a very isolated space. The concern that I have is that this is actually in the opposite direction of equity in many ways. Many of the students in the band are there because they like the community and they mm -hmm. like to be surrounded with the music and they like the break from uh, the studies of their other majors. I mean, 65% of the band are non-music majors. Mm -hmm. And so they're not here to be hardcore music. They're here because of chemistry or biology or nursing and they just need a break and that's what band gives to them. Uh, we will be meeting as a band on, mon on Wednesdays and Fridays at three o'clock um, we're going to call it coffee time with da Dr. Danny, um, <laughs> but essentially we're not going to be able to rehearse because yeah. this doesn't allow for, for that kind of synchronicity. But what it will allow me to do is give them a breakout time with the, their section members if they have questions about their instruments or their parts, or just a kind of a chance to check in because that's really what we provide in the band world for a lot of our students is that opportunity to just connect with students through music. Yeah, these are tricky, tricky times <laughs> in the performing arts. And, um, you know, it'd be a lie to say that anything is the same, you know. I'm trying to look at it as a way to promote artistic discipline and to create space for artistic practice, which is something that's embedded into all of my acting classes anyway. But I feel like that's the way forward for this quarter because we're not going to have that opportunity to share physical space together, which 
that's one of the four pieces that must be in place for live theater to happen is to share physical space. We have to breathe the same air, you know. So it's really caused me to think, well, what, what is my work as an actor? And I say probably half my work happens by myself at home or outside or in a rehearsal hall by myself or researching a role um, or doing the text analysis and the script scanning that we all do. So that's how I'm gonna focus our Acting Shakespeare class this quarter is to get into some of the super nitty gritty, get farther into the nitty gritty than we would normally do in a quarter of um, finding all the text clues, right? That live inside the script. And then because we won't be able to fully work on connection, on connecting to the other or making ourselves available to respond to an audience in live space and time, we're gonna work on self. Um, and, you know, Stanislavski, the father of acting, said that's the first half of our work is to work on ourself as the actor. And um, we can do that. I have the same kind of concern that Danny has about just everyone's mental health with that. Because the payoff that we feel is in coming together to tell a story that's bigger than any of us could tell individually. So we don't necessarily have that payoff, but I happen to know what plays we'll be producing next year in the SPU theater department. And I can see already a direct line between what we'll be doing in the acting coursework this quarter and the payoff that will happen on stage next year. Well, I mean, I think one thing that, that uh, you know, we do in physics uh, is that mm -hmm. it, we, we have a really high emphasis on, on group work. Um, just because we know that students learn physics really effectively when they're when they're collaborating with other students. And so one of the things we're trying to figure out is how does all that, what does all that look like in a virtual uh, context? So, you know, we talk about uh, like a like a distributed cognition space. And that means basically a shared space where students can can, um, you know, uh, represent their ideas. Uh, so, so, you know, coming up with, with solutions, we were actually just working on it this morning um, for uh, students being able to collaboratively annotate um, graphs and figures um, so that each student has the ability at their own, uh, their own device to add to the, to the annotation of, of a figure. If you want to really um, collaborative, uh, you know, um, active, engaged uh, learning environment, uh, you have to be a part of it and you have to figure out both, you know, what are the strengths that you bring? Um, maybe you're just a really great listener and you can, you can sort of hear uh, connections between things other students are saying. Um, so I'm the same way. We work in groups all the time. So trying to figure out what technologies support group thinking and group learning is, is kind of important, I think. So between Zoom, Slack, Jamboard, <laughs> I think we'll get it. But I think you have to be flexible to add all those things together in that. Uh, I think perhaps one of the largest challenges that we are looking at is how to create learning experiences for students to practice the hands-on skills yeah. that they would normally get in, mm -hmm. in the lab. Um, and that's, you know, how do you, how do you have the, act, the tactile movement? How do you practice that, the physicality of the skills that you need to do? Um, and that's, that's our biggest challenge. I think there's, there's a lot of online resources that we can use that are actually really good for providing the foundation, the, the knowledge of what do you need to know in order to do a skill. And then our faculty are, are getting really creative with how can we create uh, ex learning experiences where they can get some of that feedback with what they have at home. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to make sure they have the supplies that they need. So do they need a blood pressure cuff? Well, we'll figure out how to get one to them. We'll make some available. So they have the, the actual equipment that they need to do the supplies. 
And then uh, doing things like having the student videotape themselves, doing, for example, a physical assessment with their brother or their sister or someone that they have at home that they can practice uh, one of, some of these skills on. They send in that videotape to the instructor. The instructor can give them that feedback um, through the, the videotape to try to create that feedback that they need in order to improve on the skill. And, you know, we can get really creative. It doesn't, you know, if, if someone lives alone, it doesn't have to be another human. It could be a, be a dog. It could be, a, it could just be a pillow, honestly, because a lot of what we're trying to teach is the process of the skills. Mm -hmm. And they'll get the, the nuances of it later on when we're back to traditional clinical learning experiences. Um, but it's the, it's the technique of where do I start? Where do I go next? How do I finish? Um, and that repetitive behavior of doing the process is what we're really going to be focusing on. And then we'll, we'll supplement that with um, more detailed clinical experiences when we can get back to that. Um, but I, faculty are getting really creative, I know, with um, figuring out how we can create the best learning experiences for mm -hmm. our students to get those, mm -hmm. uh, those actual hands-on skills and techniques. That's a lot of what I'm going to be doing also is having students submit tape of themselves. So, you know, that's what I really love about being in the classroom is they do their work and then I get to respond to the work and then we get to work together to make their work better. Right. So uh, I don't think we're going to lose that. It'll be different. It'll be different for sure. But thankfully, almost all of them have a phone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They High quality, but they self tape all the time. And actually, in the theater world, there's more and more of submitting video auditions. So um, students may actually come out with some pretty practical skills that they're going to use in their first year or two out of college. So uh, I'm excited that I'm still going to be able to respond to their work. It's just going to come via a different but writing is so social and so much of my writing classes are the importance of this social aspect of writing. And so I think I'm anxious or I'm, I'm not yet sure it'll have to wait until we actually get into the moment and we see what works and what doesn't for seeing how that social process of writing plays out, giving students the chance to read their stuff to each other, giving students the chance to listen actively over Zoom mm -hmm. to their classmates, reading their work out loud. Um, and then, and I think especially in my, both of my writing classes culminate in big projects. And so usually at the end of the quarter, we have a lot of time in the classroom where everyone just gathers together and works on their stuff in a shared space and writes. And, and they're, they're doing it in solidarity with each other, even as they're writing separate things. Um, it, it's a way to carve out time to do that work for them. Um, and then to always, for me as their instructor to be in their room and, and there's this real collaborative. So I'm not quite sure how you have like a Zoom call with 20 people quietly writing or what, what kind of alternative models we can pursue to still create that shared environment where we're all working together, even if it's kind of independently. Um, so that, that's one thing that I don't yet have a solution. I think it'll really be when I'm getting into that and, and seeing what's working and what's not working. So that's a, that's a thing that I'm, a challenge that I'm expecting to have come up. Yeah, something that um, I really love to do in this class that I'm teaching, which is really an introduction to the reading process. How do we go from being a non-reader to a skilled reader? And in that, I like to have the students experience, again, what it's like to be a struggling reader. So I have them read all sorts of bizarre things, but I also have them um, work with each other. I, I do a lot of small group work, works in groups of two or three or four, and that um, I'm not sure how well the Zoom groups are going to work for right. that. Sometimes I have students teach each other things okay. using you know, materials teachers might use. I have to, uh, students go through reading assessments. We look at decoding assessments. You know, how well can you sound out things? What's your reading fluency look like when reading different kinds of texts? And I don't know how well that's going to work um, using Zoom groups or whether I have them videotape or have them work with someone else in their family. I'm still um, working through that. Students are better in tech at technology than I am. So I just already anticipate some pretty hilarious bloopers happening. Um, and I feel like it happens in the classroom too. And I kind of love learning from them. Um, mm -hmm. One of my goals is to just get to know them as people. So uh, one challenge that I've been thinking of is how do I get to know each person? In a, 
classroom of 40? Am I going to make sure that they all check in with me by phone? Um, you know, during the first two weeks of class, are we going to have a one on one zoom session? Um, one of my goals is to know everybody's name by their face by the second week of class. And so I want to still have that challenge to myself and see if I can do it. Um, and I'm going to have to be more creative. And I think that's a good challenge. Um, I'm willing to, to take it on. But um, I think especially because I teach this class for freshmen, one of the really important things I want to have happen in that class is for them to feel that they're known by somebody, um, both me, but also people in the class. So um, one of my goals is to build relationships that are compassionate, where they learn each other's stories. And so um, as far as that goes, I think we're going to be able to do some of the same things we do in class. It'll just happen through a di different platform. So in my uh, live in-person classes, um, I actually do a lot of uh, processing with students about their own feelings about their math abilities or their experiences with statistics and try to really sell them that this is not a traumatic experience. Um, and so uh, inadvertently, I do a lot of kind of emotional uh, interventions with students mm -hmm. around stats yeah. so that they can suddenly say, hey, I like this. I'm good at this. And that actually becomes this transformative experience. I'm leaning toward doing one on ones with students mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the quarter just to talk to students about how are you feeling about this? Uh, are there any special needs that you're having? Um, and also, you know, I just want my students to feel known and seen. Um, I was an SPU student back in the day, and one of the things that I loved about my experience as a student at SPU was that I felt known in community, that my professors knew who I was, I know who, uh, I knew them as people. So I just want to say, kind of hang in there, um, be with us, we're going to try to create that community that we've always had, just in a little bit of mediation, and then we'll We'll be back at it. But I also think one thing I would like students to think about is, is let's all look for opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, we would, none of us have done this before, right? This is, it's uncharted territory for all of us. In many ways, the, you know, students are the experts. Uh, they, they grew up in this, uh, in, in this digital age in, in ways that we as faculty mostly didn't, especially older faculty like me. But, uh, but you know, I mean, I, like, like an opportunity I was just thinking about the other day is in our, in our climate change class, um, you know, how different is the carbon footprint of the university going to be this quarter yeah. compared to spring quarter last year? And I guess what I would say to students is look for those opportunities. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a chance that um, hopefully you won't get again very soon. Um, but, uh, but while we have it, um, you know, let's certainly care for each other. Um, let's, let's show compassion to each other, but let's also look for, for uh, things that we can, we can learn and experience that, uh, that, you know, God has placed before us. I think during this whole thing, I've really been so thankful that I'm at a small university, a small liberal arts university. I'm a huge fan now of breakout rooms. Trainer, you're going to be surprised. The first day when we did breakout rooms, I got to go into someone's room. They were making eggs. They were laying on the couch. They were hanging out while they were reviewing their papers. So I felt like I got to know the students even in a different way, which was really, really beautiful. Um, so I think it really made me really, really grateful to be working at a small university where our primary one of the primary things is building community. And I know we're gonna do it on this platform. Something that I would like to, to share is that uh, going back to using virtual simulation in place of traditional clinical experiences, uh, it's important to me that, that students and family members know that um, it's a different modality, but we're using the same framework and adhering to the same standards of best practice that we do uh, in the lab. And the use of virtual simulation is supported by our professional organizations. It's supported by the Washington State Nursing Commission. It's been pretty well researched in the literature as an effective teaching and learning tool. The only thing that's different is that it's a new modality for us. We haven't mm -hmm. used it before, but we are going to be employing it with the same rigor that we employ with our face-to-face -face simulations. And 
we are aligning them with the learning outcomes that we're looking for and we will be scaffolding the experiences for them so that they can really have robust learning experiences. Um, we are committed to making sure that we provide really high quality learning experiences, even though the modality is different. I would, I would just want to acknowledge the, the weirdness mm -hmm. of our situation really openly, right? And to say that like to our students, like if you, are, you're gonna be taking these online classes from us while you're feeling anxious about the present, and while you're feeling anxious about the future, while you're feeling anxious about the safety of yourself and your loved ones. And uh, like, I would want you to know that your professors are feeling those things too. Mm -hmm. um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be taking these classes and you're gonna have moments where you're angry or where you're frustrated at the world or at the technology, at the way the classes run, but just this general lack of control. Um, and I would want you to know that your professors are feeling those things too. <laughs> Um, and there's going to be times this quarter where you're just dealing with grief yeah. and this sense of loss and just this sense of things not being right in the world. And um, like, I would want you to know that your professors are feeling those things really acutely yeah. too. Um, just because we're teaching a class and just because we're saying, let's do this doesn't mean we're not going through all of those same things. Yeah. And so I think acknowledging that is really important for making it okay for you to feel those things um, and they're going to happen and and we're going to be there too the remote learning that we're going to be doing this quarter isn't what you signed up for that's that's not why you came to SPU it's not what we signed up for that's not why we chose to teach at SPU um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to work even if it's going to feel weird at times and challenging in unique ways um, I think uh, what some of your professors have already said we're we are a community and this is just such an important chance for us to come together and spend time together and be challenged in the way that we learn and be challenged through what we learn um, and to be encouraged and to be strengthened and to continue to, to, um, to be that community through those challenges. And I just wanna kind of reassure everyone that with this effort and with you as students, if you're listening to this, um, if you come ready to learn and ready to roll with some of the differences, you can have really strong, engaging, exciting learning experiences. And we are all committed to that. And this can work. It has been working, but mm -hmm. it's, not, um, it's not something that you do in isolation like a, a MOOC class. This is mm -hmm. very engaged, very um, interactive experiences. So I just wanna try to reassure you that um, this can be a really good quarter. I think we're professors in our fields because we love continuing to learn mm -hmm. and so we've been challenged to continue to learn not necessarily in places that we <laughs> would want to every single day but um but we're challenged to learn new things and that puts us right alongside you right that that even more we're we're back to being beginning readers in a way in the world of music uh, some of the great music has been created during times of intense personal struggle and societal struggle, whether it was Beethoven dealing with his impending deafness as he wrote the fate knocking on the door in, in his fifth symphony, or, or Shostak, not Shostak, um, Dvorak missing his homeland as he was writing the New World Symphony, or right. the amazing music that came out of the Nazi concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives us an opportunity to, to dig deep into things. And I would, I would say to our students, have courage to embrace the uncomfortable, the discomfort that we're experiencing right now. And if music is something that you're into, um, create. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to encourage you to, to, to express it through that way. Uh, you may not see yourself as an experienced musician or as a composer. That doesn't matter. If it's authentic and real to what you are feeling right now, use music as a way to, to move through that because it is one of the powerful ways to express the unexpressible. Mm -hmm.